Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and today I would like to um, discuss some concepts regarding research on populations prone to being vulnerable. The first thing we need to do is understand the definition of vulnerability, or, or how do we define vulnerability? Well, if you go to the dictionary, you get two senses of vulnerability. One, vulnerability or to be vulnerable means to be exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. Synonyms include defenselessness, unprepared, frail, weak, helpless, in danger, at risk. Another sense of vulnerability includes liable to succumb to temptation or manipulation. So how is um, vulnerability defined? in the research context. To understand that, I would like to resort to two international guidelines. One is the recent Declaration of Helsinki, and also I would like to refer to the SIAMS guideline number 13. Both of these guidelines are in the re resources of the home webpage of this course. Well, looking at Helsinki, we have this definition of vulnerability. Some research populations are particularly vulnerable and have an increased likelihood of incurring additional and greater harm. I'd like to emphasize increased likelihood. I'll get back to this in a few minutes. And they give examples of those who might be vulnerable. These include those who cannot give or refuse consent for themselves, and those who may be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence. So essentially, Helsinki divides vulnerability into two categories, those who cannot give or refuse consent for themselves, and those who may be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence. Now, the SEAM guidelines really acts as a supplement to the Helsinki because they are going to help us define who are more likely to be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence. Let's take a look. SEAM's guidelines number 13 says vulnerable persons are those who are relatively or absolutely incapable of protecting their own interests. More formally, they may have insufficient power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes to protect their own interests. So those who are more likely to be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence will lack the following attributes, power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes to protect their own interests. The other thing I would like to point out that's mentioned in these guidelines is that both guidelines mention this concept that all vulnerable groups need specifically considered protection, or as stated in the SEAM guidelines, special justification is required for inviting vulnerable subjects. And the last thing I'd like to point out is that people who are vulnerable are more prone to being exploited. To further flesh out the definition of vulnerability, I would like to add that it, it is really a two-part definition. What do I mean by this? Well, first, to be vulnerable, one has to be exposed to the possibility of harm. This is what I call the external condition. And then second, to be vulnerable, one has to be substantially unable to protect oneself. This is the internal component, and both elements are necessary. So someone may uh, be unable to swim uh, and hence be vulnerable to drowning, but if they never uh, swim in a body of water or never go on a boat, then one cannot be considered vulnerable unless they're in that external situation. So now we are getting closer to a more formal definition in the research context. To be vulnerable means to be exposed to the possibility of harm while, while substantially, let me emphasize substantially, lacking ability and or means to protect oneself. Now, what are some of the reasons for vulnerability in the context of reasons? Well, as somewhat 
implied before, there are intrinsic and situational reasons to account for subjects being unable to protect themselves. Intrinsic refers to a lack of decision-making capacity and hence the inability to give informed consent for themselves. And then there are situational reasons, and these include political, social, or economic circumstances that make subjects easily victimized or vulnerable to exploitation. Taking our cue from this previous slide, we can now specifically detail the different types of vulnerability. The intrinsic vulnerability, as we mentioned before, refers to a lack of decision-making ability. And then we have the situational reasons. That includes economic reasons, that is poverty, which could lead to undue inducements. And then we have social vulnerability. Essentially, one is at risk due to their social position that causes stigma or marginalization. This concept of social vulnerability could be better understood as vulnerability being the opposite of empowerment. Other types of vulnerability include dependent relationships, informal socially constructed power imbalances that are seen between patients and physicians, parents and children, students and employees and citizens and their government. And then we have institutional vulnerability, which includes a lack of freedom, and this category would include prisoners, members of the military, and communities in developing and, and even developed countries as well. Let us go back to our original definition of vulnerability. To be vulnerable means to be exposed to the possibility of harm while substantially lacking ability and or means to protect oneself. Another definition using our previous concepts of the reasons for vulnerability would include a condition, either intrinsic or situational, that puts individuals at greater risk of being used in ethically inappropriate ways in research. Now, if one is vulnerable, what are the different types of harms that could bestow upon the vulnerable individuals? Well, one could be due to an unfavorable risk-benefit ratio. So now we're talking about physical harms or due to a breach of confidentiality or privacy. We're talking about social harms and invalid consent, which now we're talking about um, someone being wronged as opposed to being harmed. If someone is included in, in, in a research study with an invalid consent, one is wronging them. And then another type of harm includes if the vulnerable individual or group has a lack of access to the benefits of research. Another concept I would like to talk about is this concern that maybe vulnerability in the research context it has become too broad of a concept. One reason why I say this is that this, this slide shows a question that is asked when one submits online a protocol to the IRB at the University of Maryland. It asks, will you be recruiting any of the following vulnerable populations? And we see a very inclusive list of many different types of groups of individuals. And then it asks if none of these applies. With this such a long list, one wonders if one is ever able to check off this last box here. And then we have in this slide examples of vulnerability that has been mentioned in various international guidelines. We have the Belmont Report and all of these individuals that have been mentioned. We have the U.S. regulations, the Declaration of Helsinki, and we have a long list of individuals mentioned as being vulnerable in the CIOMS guidelines. So, how do we rectify this concept of vulnerability as being too broad? Well, let me offer this solution. To be sure, all human beings are, are exposed or vulnerable to the possibility of harm. 
but not all to the same degree. Let me offer this definition of vulnerability. To be vulnerable means to be exposed to a significant probability of occurring an identifiable harm while substantially lacking ability or means to protect oneself. Uh, again, I would like to emphasize substantially lacking the ability. And it's up to the job of the IRB to determine whether any specific individuals or groups who are being invited to participate in a research study will substantially be lacking ability and means to protect themselves. Well, let me end this portion of the presentation. Thank you very much.